Joe Newman has written a book in which he claims this form of energy, which requires converting magnetism into electricity, could supersede all others, including fossil fuels and nuclear power. From 1965 to 1975, I gave a unified mechanical field theory, mechanics explaining gravity, electricity, magnetism, inertia, the wave and particle theory of light. None of those things ever had a mechanical explanation behind it. Not Einstein, not Faraday, not Tesla, not Edison. No one could explain one of them. I explained them all with the mechanical laws of a gyroscope. Joe was refused a patent on the basis that his machine simply didn't work, and that what he was claiming was a form of perpetual motion, which of course conventional science has always said was impossible. I was so certain that it worked when I applied for a patent, I didn't even build it. My patent attorney told me that nobody would believe me unless I built it. I built it, it worked exactly as the theory predicted. I have given my life for humanity. I stood against great odds, against the U.S. government, who has fought this tooth and nail, try to keep it away from you. And many congressmen, 11 congressmen, introduced bills into Congress to issue this patent to see that it would be produced for hundreds of millions of people across the earth. And that's the quote from them, that there was a conspiracy by the U.S. Patent Office and named Thomas Penfield Jackson, who's an SOB, uh, who stopped, tried to stop this technology. Norman Wooten is another free energy inventor who has come up against the Patent Office of America. In December 1994, myself and Joel McLean presented to the world a device known as the MRA. The MRA produces more output energy than the energy necessary to drive the circuit. It has been independently tested and verified by six different agencies with the final output figures as being 256 times more energy out than energy input. This information was provided through the National Security Agency, who we strongly suspect at the 11th hour caused the patent to be denied at the patent office, rejected with no explanation as to the reason for rejection. It's hard to believe, you know, here we are surrounded by the clouds and the mountains and, you know, the sky, and we're surrounded in a sea of energy. Dan Davidson, who has degrees in both physics and mathematics, believes the pyramids of Egypt hold the secret to free energy, and he has written a book that describes how certain shapes attract energy from the atmosphere, with the pyramid shape being the most efficient. But he, too, claims to have been sidelined by the Patent Office of America. There's a thing known as a uh, classified patent system which hardly anybody knows about. And every time you apply for a patent, it goes through a screening by someone from the Department of Defense here in this country as well as other countries. And if this device has any kind of uh, defense associated in, uh, interest, they can classify the, the, the information, the patent, and tell the inventor to go pound sand. Free energy, uh, the nature that we're talking about, would be a very disruptive technology, at least initially. It would put out of business many people who um, make their living and make their profit from conventional energy sources. Sooner or later, though, the, the transition from the conventional to the free has to take place, simply because we're running out of conventional fuels. There is no argument from mainstream science that we are running out of gas, oil, and coal, the fossil fuels that have so polluted our Earth. However, the only alternative conventional science has thus far come up with is nuclear power, with all its dangers and pollution consequences. And yet there are other sources of energy that, while they may not be the complete solution, they must surely be worth investigating. Around the turn of the century, eminent British scientist Lord Kelvin said that radio has no future, heavier-than-air flying machines are impossible, and x-rays are a hoax. So much for conventional science. Turns out that all of the world's thunderstorms are charging the ionosphere, and if you put up an antenna maybe 30 feet, 50 feet tall, you can run this motor anywhere on the Earth, and it'll just run forever as long as there's thunderstorms somewhere. And we can simulate a thunderstorm with a Van de Graaff machine here. 
the, here's our artificial thundercloud. Puts out maybe 300,000 volts. So if I connect myself in the circuit, the motor runs. So here's free energy that could be used all over the world. Plug it into the sky. You could harness electrical energy from the cloud and run a small motor with it. But the problem is that a lightning strike occurring could fry the motor and possibly you with it. Not the end. Van du. Maybe I am dreaming, but I can see it run. Why am I obsessed with these non-round wheels? Wobbly wheels that don't wobble. I can justify it and say, I'm, oh, I'm trying to do toy research, but that's not the real answer. It's just, I'm fascinated. We had a real neat experience with an uh, anti-gravity experiment. Uh, New Energy News uh, published an article about... One fascination common to many free energy devotees is anti-gravity as a source of free energy. But the killer application right now, is Professor Gurbenikov from Russia. Well, what Gurbenikov did was he mounted a huge number of these bug wings and built it into a small platform. And the, the platform, he actually flew around Russia on. Uh, here's, here's the little handlebars. He would, it was kind of like a motorcycle handlebars and he would manipulate these handlebars and this column was hollow and it would manipulate the bug wings that were built down into the inside of this platform. And he claimed that he was flying around at uh, almost a thousand miles an hour, up to a thousand miles an hour with this particular platform. Gurbanikov has since died and we found out that he destroyed the platform a number of years ago. His, uh, he felt that this technology would be misused uh, and probably add more problems to the environment. He was a very uh, strict environmentalist. He goes out and kills a hundred of these insects, rips off their covers, glues them to a board so they're all facing up. He drops a metal pin, the pin floats in the air over this, this board. He turns the board upside down, the board floats in the air. Now they're projecting down, so it's deflecting gravity. So he builds this levitating platform, and he said he used popsicle sticks, flat popsicle sticks, and he would take 10 of these shells and glue them to the top of each of these popsicle sticks, put them all together, put a shaft down in the middle, and when he turns the, the shaft, all these popsicle sticks open like a Japanese fan. And he has motorcycle hand grips, so when he turns one hand grip, it opens the two popsicle sticks in the front. When he turns the other hand grip, it opens the two in the back. When he opens them partially, he floats up off the ground. When he opens them all the way, he goes up to a thousand feet in the air. When he wants to go forward, he half closes the two in the front, so he tilts like a surfer. Gurbenikov's flying bug machine may appear to some to be more science fiction than fact, but of course sometimes fact can be a lot stranger than fiction. You see, there's a, there's a, um, a difficult choice to be made here. You don't want to have these energies introduced too rapidly. You want them to be introduced at a rate at which they can be accommodated as the...